Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, SJP Properties, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Arbor Realty Trust, and Terry's Investment Partners, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Metal Products, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal & Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Sutfin Properties, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, Triangle Services, Whitcoff Group, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller, host of the Stoller Report, Real Estate Trends in the Tri-State Region. Today I may get a little bit out of the Tri-State Region because I have an interesting topic, and in the seven years of doing my show, I've never really discussed the topic of green and energy efficiency. So I had to bring to the, together today people who really know this because, you know, I'm, I'm a novice at this business. So my guests today include Chris Daly, President and founder of the Shodrick Company, Shodrick Organization, I should know it by now. Uh, Robert Bond, who came here from Chicago, you know, because he wanted the warmer weather of New York, uh, president uh, of the Bond Companies. And last but not least, who came here from Pittsburgh, uh, Robert Randall, president and CEO of Traco uh, Windows. Um, so why is everybody so green? Why green? You know, uh, I mean, you're wearing a green tie. Kermit the Frog is green, mold is green. Why is everybody so green oriented? Mr. Bond. Um, I think we hit the tipping point on green a couple of years ago. I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Not only is it good policy from a public perspective, it's also a good economic reason. I think from a development standpoint or a user standpoint, as owners of real estate, tenants are, re are asking and requiring owners to have green properties. Sustainable properties. Why are you building them? I mean, owners are saying, you're an owner or developer. Are you asking for it or are your tenants asking for it? We think we're trying to get ahead of the curve by being a leader in this, but tenants are requiring it, tenants are asking for it, owners are, are I'm not owners, but um, users of space require it, whether it's an office tenant, whether it's a retail tenant. Um, use People who live in residential housing want green housing. Speaking of residential, Chris, you, you're, you're, you're nearly complete with this magnificent green building uh, river house um, on Battery Park City. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and why, why you did it green and what, 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 are, what green things are going to take place and what effect and what are the sales and everything and people's interest in Well, green. look, I think green, especially in New York right now, is a little ahead of the curve, but it's going to catch up. Um, what do you mean by ahead the of target, the curve? The target market, I, I truly believe, will be this next generation that's just getting into the economic main, mainstream, so to speak. Bob, and, start to make, Bob and I are out of this, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you keep telling me you're 42, so that's, I'm <laughs> assuming that's your... Thank you. But I think it's, it's going to be kids just out of school to about 35, that this is a real issue for them, and they believe in it, and they're gonna, they've are gonna they been spending money towards it, and I think they'll continue to do money and, and put money behind it and make it really impact and, and impactful in their lives. If you look at how this younger generation is really 
um, are we talking value about in their eco boomers or are we talking no, yuppies? No, they're not. They're, they're neither. It's it's this whole generation of younger people, whereas they care about politics, but they have been brought up to believe that the environment is their issue to save, and they're going to start, and they are doing it right now by voting with their pocketbook, and they're going to vote strongly, more strongly, with their pocketbooks as they get older, and they be get. They, they're getting more and more economically successful. So what, what improvements do you have in your building? We were talking a little bit prior to the show about something that, that Bob handles on, on, on the windows and, the, and, the, and, and the, the, the glass curved walls. What, what's, what, tell me about your building. Well, our, our, our building, River House in Battery Park City, is really probably the most green condominium in New York. It's, it'll be platinum rated. And we put it on almost forty million dollars in green initiatives. So we went pretty much overboard. But I think it's a good working in, environment and a, and a good show place to see how it actually works. So we're treating the wastewater, we're treating the water that you drink, we're treating the air two different times. We have a micro turbine. Um, we have solar collectors. We have solar reflectors. We have solar hot water heat. Um, all their roofs are green. We have triple glazed windows that self vent. Um, all of the uh, in interior infrastructure is sustainable materials or has no or little VOCs. So that VOC it, for my audience volatile organic chemicals. So it's not throwing compounds. So it's not throwing off any noxious gas. So your, your kids can it's crawl all around the floor. you have, the carpet and the paint and all that stuff. You smell your, and say, hey, it smells like it's new. That's the stuff that makes people ill. The, the new car smell. Have. The quintessential new car smell is making you sick. Even though we like it, it's, it's the offing of the gases that are trapped in the plastics and, and all the other materials. And, and people are paying a higher premium to be in a green building? Look, I have some people who come in and say, the only reason I'm in your building is because it's green. I have other people who say, the only reason I'm there is because you're on this park, or the only reason I'm here is that you're right on the water, you're right on, you know, right on the Hudson River. But that level of, of, of appreciation is increasing. And again, the people who come in and say, I'm only here because I'm green, or you're green, is, is a big majority of them are under 35 years old and have small children. And they're, they're placing a value on this in their lives. You know, your, your company has been around for what, 65 years? 65. And uh, you said that uh, prior to the show that you really got involved with the green initiatives in probably at the beginning of the 90s, early 90s. And you, you did, and I think it's really uh, very interesting because I want to get to a lot of it, but in 1994, you replaced the windows in the Empire State Building with energy efficient windows. That's correct, and, and uh, that was in 94, and I think in 95, uh, we did an energy audit, a comparative energy audit, and they saved over a million dollars year one, and that's back in 95. So, so, so let's, let's look, we're at 2008, oil has, has exceeded $100 a barrel. Uh, what effect, I mean, True, the, the windows were probably more expensive than a different type of window that they would put in. But at dollars and cents, what have they saved? Well, the payback has been enormous for them and, and short term. Right now, they're, they're still benefiting on an annual basis. But it goes beyond that from a fenestration standpoint. I certainly agree with Chris in terms of the next generation uh, really being interested. They've, been, they've grown up learning about the environment, hearing the horror stories. And so there's no question from a marketing standpoint, there's a receptive audience there. But the other side of the equation from a fenestration manufacturer is that the mandates are coming from the Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, that relates to U-values, which is the uh, amount of transmission uh, or energy loss that goes through a, a building. And the buildings today, uh, from an electrical standpoint, uh, consume 70% of all electrical energy, 40% uh, of total energy, and 30% of the heat loss or the energy loss in a building is through the windows. So the Department of Energy is very much interested in, in, in improving the thermal um, performance of fenestration of all types. Uh, at the same time, you have somewhat of a dichotomy because 
uh, we're learning more and more that more daylighting is good. It's good for the work environment, it's good for lear the learning environment, and, and it's good for the mentality of the individual, as well as um, having operable products uh, for air, fresh air. So uh, you have that dichotomy along with the mandate uh, mandates coming from the Department of Energy. It's a, it's a really interesting scenario. You know, you, you bring out the, uh, the, the, the uh, air, and not only the air, the uh, uh, the daylight, and uh, I think um, uh, you said to us before, um, prior to the show, uh, about the Walmart study uh, in one of their stores. Well, Walmart did a study back with their store in Aurora, Colorado, and they were trying to figure out, does it make sense to be green or does it not make sense to be green, and how much money can I save if I use daylighting, which are skylights, natural lighting versus... I hope they light. use Traco skylights. <laughs> not sure, but not sure, but I'm sure Bob can follow we'll, up with we'll them check on on that. to make sure what that is. But what they found out was, yes, there was an energy savings by using daylighting, and that was really good, and that helped them go further. But one other fact that Walmart found out is, is the consumer, there was more traffic, there was more sales on the side of the building that had the natural light than with... Um, the site that the side of the building that was not naturally lit and that was an interesting effect for them and caused them to redesign their stores so going forward when they put these energy systems in place and, and ways to save the energy costs they're also putting in factors that makes it a better shopping environment by making it more natural light and that appeals to customers I mean you in Chicago built a um a very interesting building with uh, Whole Foods. Yes. So uh, a couple months ago, when you and I discussed this, you know, we said everything. You know, they won't even sell in, you know, a sweet and low. Everything has to be natural. Uh, is that the way that they operate, or is that the way certain retailers are truly operating today, or you know, in, in the way they're building stores, that they want it to be energy efficient? Or are they putting all this? I think the retailers are looking. They, they make long-term commitments on leases up 20, 25 years and with options much longer. And I think retailers are like any other commercial tenant, whether it's an office tenant or an industrial tenant, they're looking at, I'm committing to this space for a period of time. How do I keep my occupancy costs down? What's the best way to do that? As Bob correctly said, the energy costs are the largest component of their operating costs. How do I keep those down? So whether it's Target, whether it's Kohl's, whether it's Whole Foods, all these other tenants, they're out there, Home Depot, they all make large they, they all are large consumers of space, and they are looking at ways to reduce their occupancy costs and their energy costs and anything else that they can do to reduce their costs so they can pass those savings on to consumers in cheaper products. Oh, and it's also an image. They, they, want, they want to get behind this snowballing effect of green, and they, they want to show their customers, like Walmart does, um, that they care. They care about them, they care about the environment, and it's a pretty good thing because it says, you know, don't look over here when they're getting bad press, look over here and look at the skylights. But I think more people doing that is, is a good thing. And um, I, I really, again, this, this is younger generation, if you don't build it into your store, you don't build it into your apartment, you will be functionally obsolete in 20 years. I mean, I remember when uh, Bob and I were on a panel where I moderated a couple months ago and I did some research, Citigroup has, a, has an individual whose job is to look for efficiency, energy efficiency. They have cut down in certain of their buildings the use of the escalators after a certain hour. They've cut down the, the water, you know, in the, in the fountains going around yeah. because of, of the IMG savings. IMG has a chief sustainability officer. And that's what GE this, has, her woman, G this woman's job is? GE is, uh, I forgot, the numbers are staggering. It's either 10 or $20 billion of how much they expect their sales of their company to be with green product over the next several years. It, it's a staggering number. They've made a very concerted effort. That's where they're growing and seeing growth in their company. And in the, in the window business, how <coughs> much would you say in the window, and we said uh, the, the glass wall is, is today green? How much, uh, you know, I noticed on your website you have a specific section which emphasizes green, but how, is it, you know, like Chris is saying, is it growing exp exponential? It's certainly growing without a doubt. There's a cost factor uh, without, without a doubt, but we've spent the last three years um, designing a, a next gen, what we call our next generation of fenestration. 
and it's basically aluminum based using European technology that has been proven and we've enhanced that technology um, further with uh, better, uh, better insulating qualities for the insulated glass along with the thermal frame and we've developed a family of aluminum fenestration doors and windows that really perform from a thermal standpoint almost as good as wood and vinyl. That's how good this is. And we're not finished. We have to continue on because the DOE has mandated right, even more know, I'd, I'd like you to bring that out to my audience. You said in 2025, what's the rules? 2025, the Department of Energy has mandated a zero energy loss building, which will require uh, the building to also produce energy to offset the energy it loses. So a neutral energy building. So what happens to, you know, you own buildings, like you said, you're buying a shopping center and you're closing. What happens to a property that you, that, I mean, let's take New York City. Most of the buildings that we have are old. I mean, we don't have that many new energy efficient buildings. What, what's going to happen in that market? Well, look, you know, our buildings will, you know, will meet the requirements. The, but the new, new York City, you you're not yeah, going to be. This is new building. This is going to be new, new building. It's not, you're not going to be able to retrofit. But look, I think um, you know there are certain, there are a few um, redevelopments happening in New York right now where people are looking to go green. Um, large buildings, you know, a few of them. Um, if the city can come up with some tax breaks, I think I think they'll really take off. We're so. doing it. We're we're our basis of our investment fund, our sustainability fund, is to buy older properties and green them up make them more productive, but to the point that Chris has made and to the DOE is the major cities around the United States have already committed. They're making any new buildings after a certain year have to hit certain certain um, sustainability standards so that this issue of being neutral in the year 2025, it will be a ramp up to that point instead of a cold turkey type of situation, whether it's Washington DC, whether it's Chicago or San Francisco and LA and Portland, Oregon and New York City, a lot of these cities have already committed, and they're, and they're going down their own uh, sustainability um, highway. Right. But you know the problem remains: how are you going to pay for it? But you know, and, and in, that's in, for example, in New York, and you know, you go around the country. There are a lot of buildings that are glass. I mean, you don't see too many limestone buildings being built today. You know, you see glass buildings. So the, the glass buildings are these new glass buildings being built efficiently, rare, uh, energy efficient? Would you say? I mean, Chicago, I know there are plans for certain new buildings. Are they all being green efficient? Most of the new buildings, not all of them, are, are going to be green. By the way, if you build green in Chicago, you get to get first in line for your permit. You get, you're guaranteed a permit in 30 days versus six months, eight months, nine months, or a year. That's a real economic benefit um, that the city offers to people to build sustainable. We do a lot of uh, work in Chicago, as we do in New York, and uh, a lot of window wall work in Chicago, which is the big thing, rather than curtain wall. More flexible. Um, Could you explain it to my audience, because, you know, the, the, what is a window wall and what's yes. a curtain wall? Curtain wall is a, uh, a webbing of uh, usually uh, aluminum structure that is fastened to the uh, um, um, different floor levels and then glazed in the field with glass, and it's mo more monolithic looking. Um, window wall is floor to ceiling, uh, but it's factory glazed. It comes prefabbed, and uh, therefore you're controlling the quality to a higher level. Number one, it's easier to install because you're setting the whole unit a at one fell swoop. And number three, it's more flexible from a design standpoint in that you can use all types of operable products, doors and or windows, uh, in it. And so from a residential living standpoint, it's a very flexible method of uh, design and and practical use. You you own a number of buildings. I mean, you just, besides uh, River House, you were involved with, uh, you're the co-developer with Minskoff on 89 Murray. Mm -hmm. Is that an, a green efficient building? No. <laughs> Why is that not a green efficient building? It's, it's, it's green, it, it's green to the extent that it's, um, uh, it, it would rank right now about 18 points, and it's about six points shy of getting LEED certification. So we're trying, and it's one of the things we're going to do. We're going to green up the roof and put on solar panels. So, so my question is, you own a lot of buildings in, in New York that you've built as affordable and a variety of others. Um, 
with energy high and you're paying these energy expenses, why don't you go to somebody like Bob but and, and change the windows to, you know, because these were plank. Right, but we're, we're already doing that. And all of our, all the rental buildings that we have will all be certified LEED EB, meaning existing building. And we're doing that program right now where we'll have every single one of our rental buildings either be EB certified by LEED or will be certified LEED new construction. And it's going to take about two years, but we'll be finished in two years. And then every single product we have will be, will be green. What about you? I, I, I know the attorneys told me I couldn't talk about your pro, but you are raising a fund, which is an energy type of fund. <laughs> Um, sustainability. Sustainability. I don't want to. So, so who who are they? Are they, are they the major corporations who are who are really interested in, into this? Uh, the inv I mean, who who's who's on the bandwagon? I remember when you were uh, you and I were on the panel. We were talking about green is more important in certain aspects than in asbestos. You remember the guy from Tishman Spire of UK was saying that that this is going on. Where do you see this momentum in the next five or ten years? I mean, I, I, can, I see continually that more and more product will be built to green or sustainable standards, as Chris is doing, and he's just one of many developers around the country that are doing that. And I see that more and more users of that space, whether it's a person living in, in a, an apartment project or a condominium or retail tenants or office tenants demanding that of the owners of the, of the space. So they're either going to have to retrofit the buildings to lead EV standards or, or go into new buildings that have these, these efficiencies. So, so, so for my audience and myself, what are, you know, I heard Chris was talking about filtration and the water and, uh, you know, the skylights and other things. What else are we, what else can we do to make a building uh, energy efficient today? There are many ways. You can I, I, that's what I'm asking, the question. I mean. Well, look, for, look, for existing buildings, you can put in um, carpet, again, that doesn't have these VOCs. You can put in... Um, but I love those VOCs motion, in the car. <laughs> motion detector lighting. So in the hallway in New York City, we have to provide lighting all the time. But as soon as you open up a door, it can trigger the lighting to go in the hallway, and that's acceptable as far as the Department of Buildings is concerned. Lighting's a perfect example. It's one of the low-hanging fruits in trying to retrofit a building. By getting rid of the T12s and T8 fluorescent lighting to go with the lower wattage T5s, you're, you're, it be, it, you're saving energy, you get brighter lights, makes everybody happy. So th that's a real simple way. Most people can adjust their buildings and fine-tune their buildings by and save maybe 10 percent, 8 to 10 percent of their building's energy costs by just better tuning it. Then that allows you to evaluate your HVAC s systems that are in place in the buildings. And once that's figured out, and if you have an older building and an older system, then you can size the HVAC equipment to the right, to the right size for that building, which should inure to um, energy savings. And that, that may be expensive, but lighting's like the first way to go. And then, you know, package units for HVAC is more expensive, but there are simple <coughs> things you can do. I know in New York, you're, you're doing some, you're, you're doing some retrofitting of a number of buildings. Um, 1407 Broadway, which was once a predominant garment center building, which is still a garment center building, the, the new owners are putting in all new windows. Uh, I think you're also doing the toy center buildings That's over right. there. Uh, these people have made the decision, uh, you know, it's tough to, is it difficult to get more financing for these green, for these type of windows? Well, it, it's a, from a developer standpoint, I don't want to speak for either. No, no, but, it, but it, I mean, there's a difference in cost. I mean. Yes, there, there is a difference in but cost, I'm, and the payback may not be uh, what is normally acceptable as a payback. But being a good, good corporate citizen, uh, it, there's a marketing be uh, benefit, without a doubt, when you can talk to a tenant about uh, better sound uh, attenuation, when you can talk to them about better thermal efficiencies in the, in the product, uh, operability of the product. Um, these are important to tenants, and they have to compete as, uh, uh, as we all do. So any, anything they can offer the tenant that is state-of-the-art, um, has some sizzle from a marketing standpoint, is a win. We look at 
when we look at doing anything that's going to have a sustainable feature, we try and look at what's that payback. What's the economic, whether it's a lower first cost, upfront cost, or whether it's uh, an operating cost that we're saving on. So if we're putting a roof on, we look at a white roof or a green roof, depending on which, which climate we're in, because the climate will determine what kind of products that you use. And we, we look at what those economic costs or savings are to determine how, which product to go for that particular project. But you know, I think it was you, I'm not sure who brought it up. You know, in certain aspects, I, I remember when uh, people, this goes back when there was the oil shortage going back maybe 25 years ago, even though I was 12 years of age <laughs> at that time, um, people were putting solar panels, solar heating in, and they were getting credits for putting the solar credits in. Shouldn't it be maybe part of the administration and maybe what you just said about Chicago, if you have a green, you're, you're able to go to the permits earlier. Besides having the right of going to the permits earlier, couldn't there be certain tax incentives to do this? Yeah, of course. No, I mean, but, you know, you've got to get the government to do it. I mean, Chicago is a perfect example. Chicago, other than Battery Park City, which is the most green community in the United States by far, Chicago is far ex ex exceeding whatever New York is doing. I mean, it's, it's really, it's almost embarrassing. And we have a great mayor, as you know. And, but, and but part even of this what, city is taking too long to move forward. There's what, no what do you see around the country? You know, you, you sell product all around the country. Where do you... We do. Uh, in the West, uh, the West Coast certainly has been at the forefront of uh, the, the, the green movement, without a doubt. And they will pay for that, that, that improvement. Uh, that they will pay for that benefit for all the right reasons that we've talked about earlier. As you come East, uh, it's, it's slower and slower. The, the Midwest, Chicago, is... is terrific city and, and well well led well managed and they've got a great vision uh, and so uh, it's very much at the forefront there uh, but every city we see now has um, programs even in New York City uh, Mayor Bloomberg has uh, he wants to cut uh, uh, co2 emissions uh, by 30 percent in the next uh, I think 20 years 20 15, 30 20 years planning. something like that uh, 2025 again I think something like that but there are initiatives just beginning. It's in its infancy. Believe me, the ball is rolling now, and momentum is going to continue. So, so I think the, the, the real question, which, you know, it, it took me um, seven seasons to do a green show, <laughs> and I think when I probably come back for the eighth season beginning next September, uh, I'll have a, another green show, and I'll bring up more ideas on energy efficient, and I hope to bring back people like the three of you. I'd like to thank Chris Daly, uh, of the Sheldrick Organization, uh, Robert Bond of the Bond Companies for flying in from Chicago and being mm -hmm. here, and last but not least, for coming in from Pittsburgh, Bob Randall of uh, Traco Windows. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about construction. We're going to have the contractors talk about what's happening. Thank you. See you next week. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nord Bank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, SJP Properties, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, Greenberg Traurig LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Arbor Realty Trust and Terry's Investment Partners, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Metal Products, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Sutfin Properties, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, 
Triangle Services, Whitcoff Group, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction.